Morgan. Here Hello. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. <sighs> Let's dive straight into this beautiful piece that ah, you give to me. Yes. Just when I walked in, I was like, yes, I remember that. Mm-hmm. And I haven't done anything like that probably since then, yeah. which was what? Oh, Two years ago now? Year and a half. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think. So and, for um, those of you watching, yeah. Uh, Morgan gifted this to me. She is in, an incredible artist, which is what we're mainly going to be talking about today. <laughs> and it's just exquisite. And um, if you're just listening, I highly encourage you hop onto her social media, but maybe also hop onto the video and just have a look at this unique, mystical piece. That yeah, I feel like I'm going to, like I said, I walked in, I was like, I think I needed to see that today because I'm about to start on a pretty big uh, collection Mm -hmm. and um, canvases and all that stuff. Uh, And then I had totally forgotten about this kind of tangent. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great tangent. Yeah, I like it. What does it represent to you? (laughs) Um, Everything. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, you know, it's just on the way down here I was thinking that it's like it's so hard to – make tangible the intangible Mm -hmm. and this I feel is the is a pretty close uh, starting point to kind of my channel of like the way I see and feel and yeah that's it really like see and feel and move through things Mm -hmm. and create with and you know that it's like that black darkness but there is this dark rainbow with it Totally. You know, and the gold. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. uh, I would agree. Uh, It feels like that kind of dark and light merging, that Shiva Shakti merging. And that's such a beautiful thing about the mandala art that you do. Mm. And the kind of, it feels very similar to the ancient kind of mandala art and the, the yantras that we see here. They're like, they evoke and invoke uh, these innate qualities within us. Yeah. And I would love to uh, just hear a bit of your journey. How did how did you get into this? I don't think I even know. Oh, oh I just got goosebumps. Yeah. Because um, it's, a, it's this ever unfolding story, you know, that like now I have a few years to look back on and kind of see the pinpoints, which is I guess I kind of look at the whole thing like this mandala itself, um, you know, obviously life and and – a creative journey and stuff, um, that I was in Bali about, it doesn't, isn't it always in Bali? (laughs) The start of something magical. Um, yeah, I was in, uh, Bali in Ubud in this amazing tree house, um, uh, like, uh, in part of the green village, do you know that kind of area? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was the original house that was built as part of the green, uh, community kind of over there and it's all open and everything was bamboo and I had seen it and wanted to stay there and it was booked out and then it uh, my family and uh, friends had organized it was a surprise so we ended up getting to go there and I remember on the first day um, they took uh, a tour this is a little bit of a story because oh, I love going. a good asked, story so. <laughs> And, um, yeah, the first day, you know, they do a little bit of a tour of the house and there's like four or five levels and you go up this spiral staircase and takes you up to this lookout that looks over the Ubu jungle. And they also um, showed us like when you look down the spiral staircase in the centre, you know, there's like a pond like the five yeah. levels down, there's fish there and the place was absolutely incredible. And while I was there, there was so many rooms and um you know, super quiet near the river. So you can kind of hear the water in the background and stuff. And uh, I'm a musician as well. And I had my guitar there and I had a little, you know, recording thing set up and we were there for about seven days. And throughout that time, I started drawing these freehand mandalas and just, I guess there was probably like cushion patterns and a few things around the place. And obviously, in Bali, um, mandalas everywhere. And I had doodled and stuff like that, like with some kind of like a flower type thing in the middle and then expanding outwards. And I'd been kind of doing that since I was a kid, just bored, sit there and do that and stuff. And and I guess like 
there was something about being in that place that evoked that kind of childlike, some kind of a mm. pinpoint that I started drawing them. And I did them in all colours and I ended up doing one for all of my family and friends that were there with me. I did a specific one for them. And I don't know, it wasn't, I didn't think about it much um, at the time and just relaxed, passing the time. And then got to the last day, about seven or eight days in, and I was recording some music just, or if every single other person that was there had gone to get a massage and I had said, you guys all go first. There wasn't enough people. So I just sitting there and had my headphones on and because the microphones pick up so much, I could hear the river, I could hear somebody sweeping, you know, and the kind of like the birds and the and the rustling of the trees and I was playing my guitar and I was singing some harmonies and things and just I can't explain it but this music piece that I kind of that came about it's just a little sample there's no lyrics or anything it's just kind of gibberish and humming and Mm. harmonies and things and there was just something really special about it and in the like middle of it I just was like oh my gosh I remember that on the first day when they walked us up the spiral staircase, right in the centre of the uh, house was all these bamboo trunks and that was kind of the centrepiece. And I just remembered at that last moment there that there was all these strings built into one of the trunks like strings of an instrument that you could play. You could pluck the strings or play it with a bow and it kind of went all the way around and spiralled up. And I ran up there. I was in the middle of recording and I ran up there and um, start, I was still humming everything that I had just recorded and I started plucking the strings and I was writing the music in the exact key of the house. Wow. And I got this really strong, I don't know, message feeling. I'm able to now say it's like I can put it into words. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was this understanding just saying you have to follow your bliss it takes three years and if you knew what it was at the end of that three years now, if you if I you know, if you were to know what the final thing is now, it would like wipe you out like mm. you either wouldn't believe it or you know, it's just a feeling of like you're not supposed to know wow. anything that is coming. And over the next three years I kind of just always had that there. And it um mm. as it like unfolded, all I could do for that following year was just dive into mandalas and I just drew them all the time as solidly for a year. Wow. So many of them where even when I had stuff that I really needed to do, if there was, a, I was lucky enough to be able to have the freedom to do it. But some days I would just be like, I'm not even getting out of bed. Like wow. I'm just going to spend seven hours drawing a mandala. And it's led to so many things and so many opportunities and changes and it's brought me back to music. And it's been this constant from that moment on. And that's, it's been three and a half years. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of now that I feel like everything is being birthed Amazing and true that Mm. if I had have known then I would have been so overwhelmed because I just did not have the capacity to be able to maintain and handle just the self-discipline and responsibilities Mm. to actually deliver these tangible things that represent such a big, like, like that represent everything, you know, like your inner being, your feelings, your emotions, your creativity. So it was like a practice you were doing at the time, just doing it all day. Yeah, because it's very rhythmic. Mm -hmm. Like once you get into it and it's very much about all the tiny, small movements and steps Mm. create something of a big picture that you can't see at the beginning. And at the end, yes, there's a tangible finished product, but that's not what it's about, you know. And so I was having problems probably for the few years before that Mm -hmm. um, of actually finishing the things. And all of that stuff is finishing now. Like it's – and also if you had have told me back then, oh, you won't actually release any music in the next three and a half years and you won't finish these things that you've just started and you're so excited Mm. about and this won't happen and these things will not eventuate and this will change and that will fall apart and you'll do this and you won't be there and I would have been devastated, Mm. you know, so it took time to unravel. Has it been a big transformation compared Mm. to say like prior to three and a half years ago Mm. and beyond to now? Has has there been a lot of transformation in beautiful ways, but has there been obstacles along the way in that transformation as well? Absolutely. All right. of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's probably just now, like this is a great moment, mm. even just you and I talking and lining up the way it's lining up. Yeah. It's just, um, 
you know, I can see that you're one of those little pinpoints for me as well. Mm -hmm. Like even with Flow Festival and actually painting the mandalas when you invited me to do that. I know you're like, come on, you should do it. You should do it. And I was like, no, uh, I don't think so. And and I get, I notice now that's a bit of a, has been previously a little bit of a habit of mine where Mm -hmm. people are saying, no, no, you need to do this. You should do it. And I'm resisting it. And it doesn't, I don't feel that way anymore because I feel a lot more grounded Mm -hmm. um, in what I'm doing. And I do, I'm, I think that's probably the biggest transformation that when people, I think, I guess before when I was doing music and just a little bit of art or kind of a lot of things, Mm. there was a lot of outside, um, you know, talk and representation coming back at me of like, you can't do all of the things. You have to be one. Right. Um, Cause what, what scene or what, what would you have described your previous years? Cause you were, um, you were recording a lot and it was just mm. music, music, music. Mm. Um, I know you've described a few upheavals and challenges that came with being in the scene that you were in. Mm. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I can and put then, a little stamp on that. Yeah, because you, you would have been primarily a musician then and now it's kind of changing into something else, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, I guess I grew up here in Perth and I um, was playing like acoustic cafes and things like that. And so I'd kind of been doing that for years and then um, – after a lot of work and when I started to really focus on it and I, I, um, you know, read a couple of books when I was about 22 that, that changed that focus into more about laws of attraction and, um, affirmations and kind of manifesting. And I probably hadn't heard the word manifesting cause that's kind of a more recent like explosion, you mm-hmm. know? Um, but yeah, writing affirmations and being in that, um, when I started leaning into the whole, I'm already there, I can already feel it. The manifestations were big and fast Mm. and probably too big, too fast. And so then when I found myself within like nine months of reading these books and, um, just starting to focus on things, I, um, was signed to a major label record deal with this global deal and this big corporation and, you know, where there's contracts and there is, managers and booking agents and image and um, timeframes and deadlines and tours and all of that stuff. And that kind of stuff was, I really enjoyed it. Um, But I feel that I can say now that it was not the right time. Mm -hmm. Like if I had a, could have switched, oh, you could say this about anything though, right? Like your mindset now. If it was here now. Yeah. And yet it's funny because actually probably I'll rephrase that. It's probably not the mindset because I was, I, I had that courageous kind Mm -hmm. of bold leaping into the unknown, being able to maintain it, but I didn't have that content that I have now in terms of the, really being able to get across Mm -hmm. what I'm supposed to get across. And so, yeah, that scene, I moved to Sydney and, um, it was tough, like in terms of, me delivering constantly and being in absolute heaven of creative. Um, creatively, I was had the freedom to do everything I wanted um, and I was doing that, but it wasn't ever getting anywhere. So it was like I think I ended up over about a two-year period recording uh, 70 completely produced finished songs and every single one was a no to a release. Mm. And, like, that takes its toll. I think when you're, you know, working really hard and and I focused and I achieved something, you know, I was 24, almost 25 when I signed my deal, which in, I guess, like the pop world and that is like that was never going to happen probably five years earlier even because you've got to be like 13 to sign a deal and develop for five years. Which is radical. I mean, yeah, the the artists that mm. really get huge at like, like you know the Justin Bieber's yeah. and that kind of thing. I get that would would be so hard to manage. Yeah, and we see it again and again, like people losing their shit yeah. when they're that big, that young, or maybe not even that big, but just what is expected from such a young age, the athletes, the musicians, yeah. where it is expected for you to hit your prime, like on way cue? before twenty on cue, and on cue, and then. <laughs> Over 20, over 25, like you, you're over the hill. You know? Yeah. And it's funny because I kind of always had that thing. I mean, but you know, my management um, told me to lie about my age right. and lie about my personal life. I'm, I, I need to be single 
Okay. I can't have a boyfriend. Yeah. But, you know, it's like, and I had this great kind of support team around me uh, in terms of my personal life. Um, but then, you know, that stuff got hit with a lot of stuff mm. because as I was in Sydney, it was pretty isolating and just, yeah, that constant, like constantly working and delivering and then never getting a release and really fighting for that and starting to get a little bit like, well, so frustrated, mm. you know, and I um, wasn't allowed to play gigs because uh, it was this whole idea of, you know, building an image or a persona or, yeah, a career in being a ticketed artist. Right. And, you know, like um, I got offered a, uh, I think we got, we tried to put me forward for um, a tour with Adam Lambert, who now he was on American Idol mm-hmm. like back in the day and he's like the singer for Queen now and, you know, he's a huge, um, huge star and he was coming out to Australia and, and I think someone had suggested, you know, you should go for this. And my management at the time were like, uh, no, that's not the right, the right avenue that we want to go down. So I'm going to pull, pull your pitch out. And then I got offered it because apparently someone at the label was like, no, we're going to override this mm. and we, we do want you on the bill. And so then speaking to that management and, and, and them saying, Oh, it's the most exciting thing. This is so great. You've got this thing and this health support's ready to go. Oh my God, how amazing. And me being at that moment, how come it's okay now that mm. I can do this? Because I'm confused. I'm like, I thought that this wasn't the right path and I let it go and was trying to hone in on like the right kind of shows to play and stuff. Oh, but we didn't think that you would get it. So I didn't want you to raise your expectations. And I was a bit like, but so now it's okay to, but, do, but how does that change the path? Like, mm-hmm. which is it? And that kind of feeling of going for something and pulling back and going for something and then canceling it and then doing it. And then that was a constant relationship that I had or probably life experience I had for like three years, which over that time really screwed with mm-hmm. me and my mental health and my ability to differentiate people, trust people, it blew everything up, you know. And then once I finally got out of um, that kind of scene, and I mean the thing is, is like I did that tour and three weeks later got booked for a bigger tour and then was going to be booked for like a Katy Perry. And obviously there's no guarantees, but it was a case of you're so in the running for this. They love what you do live. And the record label wouldn't release any of my music and I ended up saying, don't put me forward for this Mm. without a release. Like I can't actually get to any of these amazing people and fans and people that are like, we want to connect with you. Where can we experience you? Oh, sorry, you can't. And that was so incredibly frustrating and obviously created a bit of a resistance thing for me in Mm. my personal thing, life, you know, experience where, I guess it forced a belief into me where or I started to, I didn't even realise I started to go, oh, I guess I can't release anything. And mm. then when I look back now, I think, yeah, for the following two years after I kind of got out of the deal, I was also then going that I'm ready to go. I'm not going to do it. I'm ready to go. I'm not going to okay. do it. This is ready. It's not, can't do it. And constantly losing the momentum and that's what has shifted probably in the last six months Mm -hmm. and now is the time where even when I feel that popping up it's like it's this faint voice in the background remember you can't actually release this I'm like yeah okay anyway off you go you know and that's been a new habit to kind of get in there a teacher that we uh we practiced with two weekends ago, Jose Calaco, he calls that, that little voice you're describing as the, the little motherfucker that, <laughs> that pops up totally. and tries to sabotage your show and um, yep. sabotage your life really. And, yeah. and I mean, a big part of the yoga practice is to uh, witness that little motherfucker and, mm. and gradually purify it, gradually strengthen our conviction and our clarity of, of our, our true perception. Yeah. And so easy, especially now with social media, mm. to get sucked into that little motherfucker of, um, with all the comparisons, it's so easy to fall into that trap of comparing with someone who we perceive as better or someone who, whatever, the, the, the comparison game seems to be amplified now with the whole social media thing. Mm. So yeah, that, that, that's an intense trip, you know? And, yeah, absolutely. And mm. <clears throat> I kind of, there's, there's a, for me, I, I, 
there's a place for that little motherfucker. Yeah. And I enjoy when that voice comes in, when I'm creating something right. or I'm ready to release something. Yeah. I give it a moment because I know what my um, creative process mm-hmm. is because I guess that's what I studied so much over the last couple of years to know where it's bullshit and mm-hmm. when it's real like, and when I should listen well, that's and I the, shouldn't. That's the yogic skill yeah. to discern whether it's bullshit or not. Yeah. It's when that's when you haven't quite obeyed the motherfucker. Yeah. You, know, you haven't quite... <laughs> Suck, being sucked into its uh, mm. sabotage, you know? Yeah, and, and I like to give it a little bit of, you know, oh, he, I'll listen um, when I'm in the creative process. Like it, it's like it has a little box mm. that it can appear in That's and great. I still choose to listen or not. Yeah. You know, sometimes I just am in a rebellious mood with my creativity and I'm like, no, it's not happening. Yeah. And then other times I'm like, mm, yes, maybe you do have a point. And I find that for <laughs> me it's like when I'm creating stuff, sometimes my momentum gets so, um, so – What's the word like? Inflamed, all, like well, raging. Yeah, yeah, like all encompassing and everything. Uh-huh. That it's like I am like going so far down the stream. Like it's great, and it extends right out. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes it's like that really eager, excitable kid that is like, yeah. yeah, no, 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 we've got to keep going, we've got to keep going. And it's just a little bit like, yeah, yeah, no, like just dial it back just a little. I'm not like telling you to stop, mm-hmm. but you know. And that's been something that learning that and I think that's the motherfucker going you know just it used to be stop stop everything right. don't do anything and now it's like whoa, whoa, whoa it's like this kind it turns up in this other kind of guise where mm-hmm. it's like you know what you kind of are going a little bit too far down this path because in the end you're gonna hate the whole thing yeah. and it's you're going off on a tangent um sometimes I just keep rolling and find that I fall into really easy patterns where um if I'm creating, I can sometimes it, you get so into it that maybe I can go down like a, um, a bit of an easy or a comfortable path rather than, and that's when it kind of pops up and goes, are you just being lazy? Mm -hmm. Like, or could you really just take a minute, take a breath? Is this really where you want to go? And that's kind of where it comes in to go. You're, you know, you're being too, I mean, for me, it's like, you're being too lame. You're being too mainstream. And then, you know, I kind of take a step back and I'm like, I don't care. Or Mm. I'm like, yeah, fuck. Yeah, you're right. You know, so it has a place, but yeah, trying to put it over there and be like, and you're not welcome anywhere else because I'm not going to listen to you. Yeah. It's tough. Well, it sounds like you're doing some pretty good witnessing there, being able to witness it and hear it, but not, not compulsively get sucked into it. I think that's the the toxic trap is uh, most of us identify with that little motherfucker and we're we're constantly perceiving the world from that place and every bit of judgment upon someone else or every little bit of criticism towards ourself, it's it's just, just like a jackhammer just draining us of our potential. But it sounds like there's quite a bit of space in your experience to witness that. Yeah. That and there's times in a where, critic and, yeah. And there's times where like I wake up mm-hmm. and it's like right next to me and I'm like, yeah. Whoa, how did you get in here? And then I think <laughs> of things like, I'm like, Oh, cause I had half a bottle of wine last night. Yeah. That would be why. Or, you know, oh, maybe when I hang out with these people or maybe right. when I, what was I doing yesterday? Mm. Oh, I was watching a lot of this type of thing on Netflix while I was drawing or yeah. I was listening to these podcasts or whatever and sometimes like things that I think are um, good and fun, you know, result in that voice being a little louder and sometimes that's okay. Like, it's it, okay. you know, it's just kind of going, yeah, but I had fun. I don't have to feel guilty about this yeah. previously but this is the kind of what like the – well, the hangover of it or the, um, mm-hmm. the extra part that comes with it. So you kind of, you deal with it, you, you make the sacrifice and go, all right, this is going to be shit today, but you know, and push through or mm-hmm. relax. And that's been a big change as well to yeah. like not feel guilty about maybe not creating enough or, right. um, doing something a little less than perfect or, you know, that kind of thing. I do. And I think this is really a helpful conversation for people, Mm -hmm. especially whether it's people that are entrepreneurs and just creating their own thing, kind of walking to their own beat of the drum or 
someone that's wanting to, they're wanting to take that leap into their own dreams and visions and creative pulses yet, mm. yet that little motherfucker, that, that doubt or that fear is stopping them yeah. and intoxicating them. And that, that I think it's really helpful to um, have the, hear these conversations and have those conversations to realize that we're not the only one. People yeah. can often feel like they're the only one. Yeah, like, you know, exactly. Like if you look at Instagram and mm -hmm. you're looking at this thing and you see the finished product and all that stuff, you know, and, and I'm I'm trying to find a way to be able to share this kind of stuff um, that I experience um, in a different way channel to my art mm -hmm. um, because I want the art or the music. When I say art, I do mean like visual stuff and also melodic stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I want that to speak for itself. I don't want to taint it with um, my kind of personal narration of it. However, I understand that it's so important because I know that like I, if I had of been able to hear those things or know those things in a way that spoke to me yeah. uh, from, I don't know, people, artists, just, you know, in general in life, like it would have, it. I kind of feel like a lot of the journey that I have gone on, the I could have gotten deeper with art before now. I could have gotten, could have, could have, could have, and to just kind of get to that point now and go, well, now I can because I'm able to and it's imperative to share the the personal side like this kind of stuff mm -hmm. as well yes. and you know to try and find that um happy medium of mm -hmm. not having like a basically a reality tv show going on <laughs> my instagram the whole time when the art is mystical and mm -hmm. mysterious and the music that i make it sounds like that you know and it's hard to kind of find that that way to share it all so these conversations are great mm -hmm. you know because it's um it's not like trying for on my part, I guess, to create another art form of like, let me write it in this amazing <laughs> Well, you know, do write the book. <laughs> you do express it beautifully, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, the, Thank you. The highs and the lows and the struggles and whatnot. I have read some beautiful posts of yours ah. that have, yeah, been beautiful and just honest and candid. And yeah, yeah I, I do think you're in that balance in a big way. Thank you. I yeah. think it takes practice like with anything. Mm -hmm. Like um, we were saying like about hearing that voice that's going on and, and any entrepreneurs listening or anybody that's thinking about taking the leap or diving in, you know, uh, the hardest thing that was part of my lesson was patience. Mm -hmm. And I could feel that coming up right at the beginning when I kind of got this message or this idea of it takes three years and, you know, and it was patience and to really, really now understand not just patience to say, learn the skills to draw and paint and like those physical things and learn the skills of being able to maintain um, self-discipline and, and things like that, but to learn patience in forming and unraveling habits and thinking patterns and beliefs and stuff like that. And I tend to think that personally, um, I grew up with like I was the only one in my world uh, that believed in me to no end. I was that bolder like, no, nah, it's happening. I'm doing it. I'm going to learn how to record my music at home. I'm going to learn how to be a producer at 17. I'm going to learn how to do that. I'm going to record this. I'm going to go on tour. I'm going to learn how to write press releases. I'm going to pretend to be somebody else calling up as my manager <laughs> like because I read the Richard Branson book and like, you know, I'm going to email from a different email like as a representative, you know, and, and all those kinds of things like that whole fake it till you make it kind, mm -hmm. kind of thing to, you know, do all of that and it's kind of like, to learn the patience that um, if I grew up that way and I had that belief and when people were telling me you're not going to be able to do this and now you're too old and now this is going to happen it's ten years, almost 10 years later and I'm like, well, now I'm really doing it. So, you know, that patience of um, whatever beliefs and things I clearly listened to in my mid-20s took root whereas I think a lot of people probably come from that at the beginning and um, they have they unravel it, which is this, it's a beautiful thing as well. Mm -hmm. And I guess I feel lucky that for my journey because I had that 
unwavering belief in myself before and then I lost it, I got to experience, I guess, what I feel like there's so many people that didn't have that experience growing up where they believe in themselves and are literally encouraged to question everything Mm. and that you're being told at six or seven, you're in a system and you're going to be trained to follow this and to just know that it's a 3D universe at the age of eight or nine, not totally understanding, obviously, but to kind of know all of that somewhere. I think during my really dark times that I had over the last, yeah, four or five years or so, and like everything got so dark and I felt like I lost hope completely, Mm -hmm. but there was some kind of an ember going, but you know that it's different to that. And I feel lucky that I could literally look back at moments in my life where I'm like, but I did that and I was the only one who believed in me. So I must have been right to believe in myself, but I was questioning it, you know, and so I feel lucky that I've had these great experiences where I, yeah, at 25 signing a global major label deal with where they changed the contract rules, you know, like that lawyers and things had been trying to change for ages and people were just like, I don't know why they're doing this. And, you know, it didn't eventuate into anything, but those kind of beliefs and feelings um, grew and changed there. And then it gave me a basis to kind of come back to. And, you know, that's what we're all coming back to anyway, right? That's part of the journey to believe in yourself and understand and express it and just know it, you know, and get it out there. Totally. Mm. Thank you for sharing. That was beautiful. Mm. (laughs) Um, Your current project, Mm. where's that at? Oh, uh, so it's got a working title of art music okay. because it is an EP of music yes. like any normal music that you can hear and get on Spotify and all that. And then uh, a visual collection uh, to expand on it. So on those sounds. And so um, originally I had thought I was going to do a seven track EP and that each individual song would have three painted or drawn physical art pieces that expanded on it. And I did a Kickstarter to um, get the funding to kick that over the line and stuff, which all went through and everything. And then there were some issues with pledges not actually actually following through. I've read that. That's really unfortunate. Interesting um, because, you know, of all the things you tick and you check off and I took everything that they say, you know, take it all into consideration and that's, that's the cheeky stuff that the universe does to you. It goes, yeah, but there's going to be something that you're going to get that's unknown and you're going to have to deal with it. And, you know, I went through the, oh, my God, yeah. what am I going to do? You know, because I didn't get the funding in the end, like it was two and a half grand short or so. Um, it's not that big a deal, you know. And I kind of looked at everything, had some issues with getting into the studio and stuff. And so um, time frames were pushed out and I'm like, oh, my God, it's like, probably me a year ago, well, it's all over now. Like this is exactly, it's just confirming what I already knew that nothing's meant to work. Mm. And, you know, like, like I said, I never thought that before I would go, okay, cool. Anyway, so next. And so I just kind of pulled that back up in me and went, yeah, okay. So what can we do? I'm like, well, the people that believe in this, believe in me and what I'm going to do. And I don't want to do a half-assed project. So five tracks, it's going to be, I've recorded three, um, Two of them will be singles and I am so in love with them. I haven't been in love with any of my own music in this way before. Wow, I can tell. you're so exciting. You're lit up. It's giving me shivers. It's beautiful. So exciting. And, um, yeah, we just mixed the first single. So it's just a case of mix, master, plan the um, release for that. So that will kind of the first rep, iteration representation. I don't know. I use weird words sometimes that don't actually make sense. <laughs> they <laughs> so feel like they should make sense. Yeah. Um, but the first kind of pinpoint of this new kind of thing it should be out. I'm hoping to have a solid date in the next week, but it should be out April, mid, mid April, um, which luckily is only like a couple of weeks after I kind of thought everything was rolling out. And um, somewhere along the line in the last month when all of the kind of upheaval happened, I realised that art is not just about what I've already done and known, so painting and drawing. And I realised that all the video clips that I love to make, like with art and stop motion things and all the graphics that I love to do, that's all art as well. So 
the art pieces that it, that expand on it are going to be visual things in terms of like video and um, moving things and also um, – I'm going to experiment with jewelry and like mm. pieces because I used to have a jewelry line and I kind of thought, you know what, it doesn't have to just be canvases. Mm-hmm. Cuz I think that was boxing. I was boxing myself in going, oh well, it's got to be this thing. Okay. So, yeah, we will uh I've got a little bit more to record. Wonderful. And um I just started on the first artwork, which is a very intense mandala drawing. So do you um, listen back to your music while you're creating it? I haven't or, been. Okay. I haven't been because I'm in mean, the two tracks that are finished. Yeah, when I put them on, I'm like, yes, but I take breaks from it mm-hmm. so I don't get too bored. Yes. Uh, yeah. But the other ones, they're half done, so I don't want to listen too much mm-hmm. because I feel like they'll get in a bit of a box when I need to go back in and finish them. So, yeah. One of my favourite albums ever um, is Tool 10,000 Days. Yeah. With the- and it's very nostalgic as well. I'll never forget when I first, the album had just been released. <clears throat> it was at 78 Records and just flipping through the the book. It's very creative. Um, each song accompanies a, a page of the booklet and you look through these uh, 3D wow, glasses yeah. while you look. Yeah, so part of the album cover has 3D glasses and you look through the art, which is Alex Gray, mm. while listening to the music and mm. it... It's powerful, that combination of visual art mm. and the music can mm. unlock something so deep within us. And, I mean, yeah. I'm not even a heavy metal fan. It was more the artistry of how much intention they put into the music, syncing up with the art and very emotive. It's just powerful. But it's, it takes them about 10 years to create each <laughs> each album because they put so much into it, you yeah. know, which I'm sure you can relate to. Totally. Well, I know that um, very, probably 2007, 2008, um, a kind of a seed of an all-encompassing live experience with art and music got planted in me. And again, that was one of those things where um, – I get it now Mm -hmm. and now I'm like I I can actually achieve it and if I spend the next um, 10 years pulling, you know, visuals that are, you know, if it's a live show, whether if it's on screen, if it's stuff you can see on your smartphone, if Mm. it's things you can listen to and you can watch on YouTube at the same time, if it's movement or if it's just paintings or if it's art or whatever it is, um, to if it takes me the next I, I would, I guess it's more that I would like to be doing that for the next 20 years, you know, so to set it up in a way that feels comfortable and that if anything comes along like an opportunity to go, hey, we want to step this up to the next level, knowing that it's not like I'm going to say, no, stay away from me. I don't want to be part of mm-hmm. like, you know, any kind of mainstream or whatever. It's not like that. It's like, but I know who I am and what I'm doing and being able to hold that. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's um, something that, is really what everybody wants. I think that's the thing. Just being able to know that in any moment um, you can be connected enough that you can make decisions or choices or be spontaneous Mm -hmm. or stick to the plan or whatever it is that you can hold that. I think it is what everyone wants. Yeah. That freedom. Yeah, that because that is freedom. That is freedom. Right. Working in a way... That brings you joy. Mm -hmm. You love what you're doing. Mm. You're creating a beautiful experience for people. You're serving in a beautiful way. It's feeding you. It's feeding others. I mean, yeah, it's it's freedom. Yeah, and it it probably took me a long time to work out that whole. I really had to dive into my own stuff and my own Mm -hmm. shit and like kind of work that out and understand my process as well and then be able to go, okay, there's going to be shit times through the process because I'm going to hate what I'm doing because there comes a point where I go, no, it's all wrong, you know, and and not beating myself up about it, just learning to go, cool, I hate it right now, but tomorrow I might come back and it'll be like this. And it's like once you kind of put the effort into going, I'll allow that to be what it is Mm -hmm. and you own it and you kind of go, okay, well, that's that. It somehow goes from this, this is my whole experience to, oh, that's this experience here. Mm -hmm. And you're then got this opening to like, oh, now there's other parts of life that I just was not able to really comprehend or see. 
And now that I have that practice of, oh, witnessing, allowing it, seeing what kind of seasons are here and then being able to go and this is what I would choose, mm-hmm. you know, and if shit comes up, oh, okay, yeah, maybe I maybe I don't want to go that way but maybe I do. Maybe it's just something hard to walk through and then on the other side it's better but being able to even feel like right path, wrong path, yeah. like you know you're not going the right way, you know this is self-sabotage, this is a bad habit, what are you doing um, compared to, yeah, this is tough, buckle down, just get through it and, mm-hmm. you know, um, sustain what you're doing and it's kind of like knowing it's more about just being through that journey and and I know for me personally on my journey it was about witnessing my own creative process because I started to see that you know the way you do one thing is how you do all things and that process was happening in like relationships and situations or maybe scenarios of trying to deliver projects or living things or the way that I would look at holidays or just and finances and kind of everything. And so being able to go, no, no, that can just be a creative process. Mm -hmm. It then opens up that, well, now all of these other things have the freedom to move because that's where I needed to just like shut everything out for a while and not release anything and not put the pressure on and step away from social media and step away from Sydney. I left Sydney, you know, and step away from people that have been there all the time. And like I had pretty much all my friendships break down and um, personal relationships and my family just blew up and like, oh, this shit went down and it was really tough. But at the end of the day, you know, luckily things, some things can be mended and some things just take time and some things you need perspective on and, you know, and then being able to kind of um, have that freedom then to explore the other parts Mm -hmm. of life in different ways, but knowing that sometimes, yeah, you got to just follow through or this is the part you don't like, but deal with it. Yeah. (laughs) yeah. And I think it can be misperceived this whole notion of freedom Mm. because I think (laughs) quite commonly people try to create a life of freedom and they think it's going to be a constantly positive utopia in Mm. which shit never happens and relationships are always just blossoming and flowering and it's all just all just love and light Mm -hmm. which seems to be this kind of old old model of freedom where we kind of cop out from life it's a fantasy it's a fantasy right which can be pulled off for a little while i think totally but then yeah no i've experienced that like and and absolutely and i think that so many people if it if it's difficult you know, if difficulties come up when, say, you are in that fantasy mm-hmm. and because you know that, what do they say, like, you know, beginner's luck. Mm-hmm. Like, and that's what happened to me when I right. read some stuff and I started doing affirmations. Nine months later, I've got this global yes. record deal. It's like, oh, my God, yeah, it is a fantasy. And, of course, the challenge was that the communication for me, and that's been my biggest thing as well, like a challenge for me, the communication. So I didn't just have that issue of communication through um, standing up for myself, but I had it in relationships and friendships that were built and things with my family, but I had it in my actual delivery of the songs. They just weren't ever coming out. I liked them and everything, but Mm -hmm. really at the end of the day I listened to them and I'm like, I don't know who I was being, but that's nothing like what I'm like the freedom that I have now in that expression. And, right. you know. I do. Yeah. 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 It's uh, it's an interesting scope. For know? sure. Mm. Yeah. To navigate um, all of that is such a beautiful thing. And, again, I, 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 I feel a lot of people resonating with that. I've got one musician friend in particular where he literally feels like he's going to be sick when he's not <laughs> creating wow. music because yeah. he's chosen to to live a uh, to work a particular nine to five job you mm-hmm. could say or eight to six job yeah. um yet his heart is yearning to create music and create art and it makes him sick he, if he's he, not he, he, yeah if he's not and and he he puts on weight when he's not he gets sick and it tears him up yet Something is stopping him. Something is stopping him mm. from leaping into, you could say, his dharma, his, his his true gifts. And he can even admit again and again, oh, it makes me sick when I'm not 
doing what I feel I'm meant to be doing. Yeah. So there's this kind of inner, inner negotiation, kind of negotiating with ourselves how much it's worth it. Am I willing to take that leap? And it's really a, a, an inner battle for people. And, and you know and what I, I like to do with that? Mm. Like um, I love to picture or imagine and kind of work with characters mm. within me that represent those parts or yeah. those kind of negotiations. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's a, there's this aspect aspect of me that needs to be seen or heard. So, you know, like this perfectionist, you know, attention to detail, which if there's too much of that in someone, you know, they're never going to do anything because it's never going to be perfect. It's never going to be done, you know, but attention to detail can be great in the right way and Mm -hmm. within boundaries and, um, Say you know, with any of those things, like we're saying, like this motherfucker that's kind of saying, oh, that's shit, don't do that, you know. Again, it's like that character or that voice or that feeling, you know, can be valid in certain areas Can be valid. Things. And there's a lot of motherfuckers out there yeah. <laughs> which, which are going to criticize your work. Well, they're all there, like, right? They're outside of you yeah, anyway. You exactly. Know? So and it's you, good to get to know it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you want to be able to, yeah, that's a good point, you know, when someone outside of you, because it's just a manifestation of you within and you've got to try and kind of figure out how to keep that freedom where you're not going to be trapped into anything, you know, um, trapped or locked away or whatever. And, and I know that, um, like you were just saying about your friend, um, not being able to create, it's conjuring up a specific experience. And I know from my thing, when I wasn't allowed to release anything and it was almost locked up, like I literally signed over my name and likeness on the contract, Mm. you know, and I remember feeling sick when I was signing it and going, this is what you always wanted, Morgan. This is, remember that, remember that, remember that. And I'm, but there was something in me going, what are you doing? Kind of like, I feel like it was like, like that personification, like that feeling of a very clear moment, so clear of intuition going, if you do this, I'm going to have to walk away like the muse or whatever it is, Mm. like you're going the wrong path, you're going the wrong path. But I still did it and, you know, it wasn't the wrong path. It was just what it was. But I guess it was showing up going probably like a fear thing going, trying to protect me going, Mm -hmm. it's the wrong path. And now I know I'm like, well, it wasn't wrong because I learned everything and I got to where where I've gotten to, Mm -hmm. you know, in terms of being able to express and communicate um, creatively. But you know, when I wasn't able to release anything, I went into fashion and I started a fashion blog and then that exploded. And that was like on an international level. And the whole time, because I was always doing music in the background, um, these amazing opportunities were coming along and getting attracted in. Cause I was still, it was like that fantasy moment of going, this is great. And that part of me that's creative kind of went, well, Oh, I can't do it this way. All right. I'll go over here. So I took my concentration and my focus off music because I was getting in the world this reflection of, well, it's not going to be released. We're not going to back you. We can't support you. So I was like, well, screw that, man. Like I'm going over here. And so I was doing fashion things and stuff. And then when the opportunities were coming in, it was always attached with, um, well, when are you doing music? Can we use your music for stuff? And it didn't even matter that there were international fashion labels like from America and stuff approaching me and talking to me about stuff, this record label just would not release anything. And I was like, well, this is never going to happen, you know? And so, yeah, it, and then I kind of went into art after that. I was just a bit like, oh, so that creative part of me has this fine. See you later. It's not going to go my way. I'm going out of here. And that's what I've had to work with going. It's not always going to go your way. Mm. There are compromises sometimes, but you have to be okay with them. You don't do a compromise with something just and then feel resentment Mm. and, you know, negative things about it. And essentially that fantasy thing was going on and, um, yeah, I did get what I wanted, but I hadn't looked beyond that and I had no capabilities or tools to handle, like, continuing on and and diving deeper into expression and Mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff and so yeah it's taken a long time to experience so many different things to get there how are you finding being in perth after sydney it's been interesting at first um I didn't do much for the first probably six months you know I just and it was over like summertime and um it was nice to disappear like I I 
it felt really good. And I did a lot of really calming stuff that I just didn't get to do in Sydney. You know, it was like make an appointment to go to yoga and because then this is happening and that's got to go and da 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 And um, the pressures of like not the financial stuff and not the I've got to go to all these distracting events and things which, you know, um, can get in the way of, you know, actually doing what I'm meant to be doing. And so probably for, yeah, I've been here about a year and a uh, year and a bit, like year and a few months. And um, So when we bumped into each other at Kings Park, was that <laughs> like then? That would have been, lot of- it was only a couple of months after I got back, I think, yeah. and a couple of months before Flo mm-hmm. because I had been talking to your brother-in-law and he was saying, you've got to get in touch with Stu. Yeah. And then I went and did Jacob's Ladder and you were literally walking up and I was like, yeah. Stu, yeah. this is weird. I was just texting about how I need to talk to you. Law of attraction, Magic. baby. <laughs> the secret. <laughs> Living proof. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's actually talk yeah. about the secret a little bit. Because yeah. I, uh, I loved it as well. Yeah, that I, I still me do. Off. Yeah. I still do. I, I, I appreciate the value of it as a like entry point as yes, like a stepping stone. Same. And I think yeah. uh, a lot of people made that their kind of core core belief system, like almost like a religion. Mm. And I did I did for a phase as well. I found it very helpful in mm. in clearing out old habituated patterns and negativity and mm. doubt. And it, it helped me get focus and the whole vision board thing. That, that was mm, such a priceless yes, tool. Right? Mm-hmm. And I was finding okay. things manifesting very quickly as well. Yeah. And, uh, but it seems almost always there's like that fantasy phase of like, holy shit, this actually works. Wow. Like I've got it. Yep. I've unlocked like the secret and it's happening and it's flowing and it does feel like utopia and things are just manifesting. And it's beautiful. It, everyone that I have observed on that kind of trip, including myself, there's then the, it ends. either the plateau <laughs> yeah, or the like plateau. a huge come down. Yeah. And beginner's um, luck. Yes. You know, because you get a little treat. And it spurs you on and you go a little further, it spurs you on and then it gets bigger and better mm-hmm. and it's very exciting and you're excited that it's working because you believe it. And then somehow you hit your own personal threshold of, I don't believe this anymore. Like right. I don't believe it can be this though. Mm-hmm. And um, there's a really good book actually. Mm. I don't know if you've heard of it, E Squared. I don't think I have either. Yeah. Amazing. Mm-hmm. I tell people about it if talking about this like kind of subject because uh, the author Pam Grout, uh, when I read this book, it, it re it kind of reignited a few things for me, Mm -hmm. which was because I always find that when you're on that, you start and it's all going good. And then if it's a huge come down or a little or a plateau, you need something completely new. It's got to get in in a different way because you already understand this. If you just keep trying it, you're already at the point where something in you is going, yeah, but we're we're forever. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that voice that goes, yeah, okay, beginner's luck or, you know, and then you find something else. And this book, E Squared, she actually runs you through a bunch of energetic um, experiments that you do and they're little things like, um, I don't know, you, I know, I can't remember that you work with the doorway and like with your arms. Come on, sell it, sell it, Morgan. (laughs) Yeah, I'm trying to like remember some of the experiments and one was about bending a coat hanger with your mind or like there's crazy stuff and you kind of, you start with these things and she's just explaining, Mm. um, giving you that belief in science and giving you belief in like energetics and metaphysics and stuff and Mm. it's very light, it's very light check this out. It's kind of fun. Mm-hmm. And just tuning into your intuition, like that, that thing where you can do the yes, no, where your body can answer for you. Mm-hmm. Um, little experiments like that. And then she, she gets you into the manifesting side of things where just ask for something simple, mm-hmm. but it's, you know, like a cup of coffee, like a free cup of coffee. And of course they're little things that they work and, you know, the experiments get bigger. And you, even when I was reading that, I know that I didn't finish it. So, but like, why did I stop reading it? Mm-hmm. Because everything worked, but something happened where I know, I know that I didn't keep reading it. I don't think that there was a moment where I tried mm-hmm. a manifestation and it didn't work. I think I probably walked away before 
before I kind of went through it, but that's exactly right. You, I think it's about, um, you have a, a bit of a, um, people have an, a, an extension of belief of mm-hmm. what is, what they can actually do in the physical world. And mm-hmm. if it comes too quick and fast, it's something in you is like literally like glitching up going, whoa, 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 what? I thought this was going to take a lifetime to get to, or, yeah. you know, you're probably right. I mean, we're evolving mm. and I think we've had collectively some big leaps mm. of our consciousness, like even that kind of stuff, mm, I think true. for many of us has been a huge leap in our consciousness. Like when we look for, uh, even a generation ago and then a generation before that, like there, there's been so much suppression and oppression and just to have like mm. our, our lenses peeled open and like we've got choice and we've, we've got yeah freedom in what we do with our time and our creativity, like that's still very new. Very. Collectively, it's still very new. And if we look at it on a global scale, it's a tiny, I don't know what it would be, but it's a tiny percentile of where people are at. Like we're very yeah. lucky to even be able to have this type of conversation and yeah. talk about art and talk about beauty. Like there's so much of the world that is still in survival mode mm. and operating from fear. So there's almost like, as Ken Wilber would put it, like a center of gravity mm. of where the collective consciousness is at. And then we step into what's possible and we get more skillful at like manifesting and creating and visualizing and it manifests. And, but then, yeah, there's this almost gravitational pull, I think, back to what's predominant still and it takes yeah, such dis- i think it takes such discipline and, and well it's the it's, consistency if the outside world is um filled with pockets of super positivity and then suppression and and you know freedom versus yeah oppression and stuff if it if the world is that it's a good representation of what's going on within ourselves because exactly. we all have those little tiny fears and that the world outside of us is the big scale of that mm-hmm. you know and so that is that whole like um work within Mm -hmm. first and on yourself first. And I think the hardest thing um, is being able to be selfish enough to take that time Mm -hmm. and really commit to going, this is just about me for a minute and, you know, I'm going to focus on that so that I can breathe and then I can give back and be there and also be in touch with myself yeah. all at the same time. Totally. Because if you don't learn how to do that, mm-hmm. you'll always, I think that you'll always be either one or the other. And it's this constant like, well, now I have to be selfish and da 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 or I never get enough time or whatever and I have to be this. But if you take that moment and go block out everything, because yeah. I feel like that's something I learned, that um, learning how to be able to maintain that connection within myself to my own channel mm-hmm. Um and the collective, um, being able to maintain that through shit that will show up, through stuff that's going to trigger me, through things mm-hmm. that I would go, that sucks, why me? But And then being like, well, is it's not even a question of why me, it's just what is. And, and being able to anchor back into that freedom of going, well, this is how I walk through it and I'm not going to drop people or leave this behind or okay. stop being creative or whatever. It's just like, okay, today was hard and maybe this month was hard or maybe this six months was really difficult in whatever way, whether it's your own self-sabotage or tragedy or outside forces or, I don't know, the stock market, whatever, mm-hmm. like, you know. And um, on what you were saying just then, like, um, you know about the tipping point. Um, you know, like with when water's boiling and at first it's all these individual molecules mm-hmm. will turn to boiling point, but there comes the tipping point where a certain number do that all on their own, not being next to any other boiling molecules. And there comes a point where instantly the other ones, the remaining ones all just get turned on mm-hmm. and they're all boiling. And that's the whole shift in the, well, I think, you know, that I think change. so too. I think we're heading towards on. that. I mean, mm. even from 10 years ago mm. to now, it yeah. feels like a huge, really? like, I don't know if it was just myself, but Gosh, it, like yeah. I had to, I had to move away from Perth because here I just felt like, holy shit, like no one 
cares. No one yeah. is doing what they want to do. They're just kind of succumbing to what their parents have told them and what society's told them. And I, I had to extricate myself from Perth mm. to be with like-minded people, go to Bali, Same go to thing. LA, go to yep. Sydney where creatives are, where people are just having the courage to do what is true to their heart. Again, I don't know if it was my own consciousness, but I was observing in particular places this kind of limited mm. uh, collective energy. Yet uh, I'm just finding in Perth this ripple of community mm. and and creatives and people having the balls to do what their heart is yearning for. And it feels to be becoming more normalized where it felt like 10 yeah. years ago. It was like, dude, like when are you going to get a real job or like, <laughs> yeah, totally. and, uh, whether that is my own experience of just getting clearer and clearer in myself and I'm not hearing much of the negativity or the judgment anymore, or it does seem pretty apparent that, that, uh, there's a that, great community here. There's a great community. You know? It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. I, I think for me coming back when you were asking me for like, how have I found it? it it's been exactly what I've needed mm -hmm. to be able to just only concentrate on getting a handle on my own creative expression. Mm -hmm. And, um, and beyond that, I can feel itchy feet, but that's because I want to travel and that's because I do want to live other places. I've lived in Perth and it's Sydney, you know, so it's like, and so for me to be able to create here, it's been the greatest um, foundation. And I don't know if that's just like, there's something, it just feels like home in a different kind of way, you know, and it's been We're nice. so lucky here. Yeah. It's We're been so nice lucky. to relax yeah. and just explore and, and yeah, very different that I meet people now that... I didn't know before, you know, yeah. when I lived here, but that are on the same page and mm -hmm. you can have the conversations. And I probably wasn't getting any of that by the time I decided to leave Sydney. Mm -hmm. um, it, yeah, it felt like Sydney was becoming, especially with this, the music industry over there, just, you know, over the last couple of years, just really got locked up and um, shut down. And so in that sense, it just felt so stark mm -hmm. and just gray and it hadn't felt like that before. And so right. it's like, okay, time to get out of here. And then coming back to Perth, it's mm -hmm. been slow and easy and nice. And that's been really nourishing, mm -hmm. you know, to right. experience that, be at the beach all the time. Oh, we're so lucky <laughs> with the beaches. We're I really know. spoiled with the choice of beaches, huh? I know. Yeah. But I back know. to the secret. Um, mm. It feels like people get to that kind of plateau point or the, mm. the polarity point where they kind of fall down after all that positivity, all that manifestation, all that gratitude. It feels like, I don't know if E squared uh, addresses it, but like the the ability to witness, like you've been talking a lot about, mm. the ability to navigate the struggles and the the shadow and so forth that comes up eventually unless yeah. one is truly a master truly enlightened tr like just deeply deeply in their heart and their center shit's going to come up eventually we're going to hit up against a, against Some a plateau way or another or, yeah like life is just like that and it seems unless we do the kind of old model of totally pulling back from the world, like the old mm. model of the the renunciate, the yogi, the monk, in which all worldly distractions, we've pushed it away, whether that is a, a healthy non-attachment or like an attempt to push away the distractions of the world, which I think is a common one. But being mm. in the world... And engaging in relationship, there's going to be challenges, you know, yeah. that's just part of it. I don't recall the secret addressing like the kind of battles of life, the challenges of life. Mm -hmm. And it feels like it gets to a point where the attitude of gratitude, positivity, affirmation, positive vision helps remedy the kind of battles and the challenges of life. And it feels like that's that next stepping stone or yeah what's you... going to come through yeah as a as a general understanding because you know they edited um the secret so heavily that um apparently a lot of the people involved when they saw the final cut um were a bit like what no uh, that's not that 
okay, that's kind of taken out of context or maybe not taken out of context, but kind of like, but you're missing the beginning and the end of this. Like, right. okay. And it's that idea. I've heard of like, Michael Beckwith talk a bit about that. Yeah. yeah. And, um, do you know, obviously Abraham Hicks, mm-hmm. um, Esther and Jerry were, uh, interviewed for it and everything. And of course, uh, they were cut completely from it, uh, because the way they were talking and what they were about was right. way too beyond what people and society would be able to actually engage with and okay. accept. And so, um, I know there's been a lot of uproar about like, oh, it's only a tiny little bit of it. Like that's not the whole thing. And that's why the skeptics can grab it and mm. make parodies of it and everything go, oh yeah, just think about something and it'll turn <laughs> up. Like, and you kind of go, oh, yeah, no, you do have to work on it and da, 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 da. And, and, um, or work on, work towards, maybe not work on the things, but work towards continuously, um, finding the light in things, mm. the, the joy. And that's what you've got to practice. work on. It's that's a what you've got to work on. Yeah. Whatever that is. And, you know, it's like with the secret, they obviously could only um, get to a certain level, you know, that would represent that I guess mainstream would actually be able mm. to um, consume. Yeah. And they did, like we did consume it. And so it hit the mark. Big time. Um, but, yeah, there's still only, it, it kind of means that, like I, I believe a whole industry has been born based off the back of that. That isn't nec- that is kind of just a similar thing. It doesn't get to the depths mm-hmm. that you need to. The tools are still quite a niche. Like mm-hmm. you find the people that are a lot more open or connected off the beaten track still, you know, and, and hopefully, but there's so many more of them. It's so much more accessible that, mm-hmm. yeah, the next wave will come, that will come through to mainstream and it might not be a movie. It might be science, it, you know, mm-hmm. but something will happen where there's a certain tipping point where people get to the next level probably quite easily. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. and the people who have done the hard yards need to have no resentment about that. <laughs> <laughs> I went through that shit for 10 years yeah. and you just woke up and within a week you, you've got the courage to go and do this, you know, like, and yeah. Well, that's what I've heard from <laughs> uh, some of the more senior teachers that really uh, took that renunciate path mm. and were in ashrams for years in the 60s and 70s and just going yeah. deep for a decade, two decades, three decades. And uh, I remember my friend Tara Judell asking Sally Kempton, who's a more senior teacher, like, I I feel called to like do what you did and live in an ashram and like kind of become a Swami, become a monk. And she was like, well, you could, (laughs) but we did that. We did that for you. Like you don't need to. Yeah. It's time to be in the world. Like we need it in the world. That's, I got goosebumps. That's a very good way, like great way of putting it Mm -hmm. um, forward that there's, there's the work that people do. And then maybe everybody on their different wave, you know, has a, hopefully an easier experience. And for the collective, you know, Mm -hmm. they can, that's a really great way of putting it. Yeah. I think. Because yeah, those challenges like like we're saying about it's a fantasy, and you think that if it if you're looking at it like oh nothing bad's ever going to happen now, and if I just follow this, it's going to be great. And then yeah, when a challenge comes up or something, um, the work is in going okay, interesting. How am I going to explore this? Or um, I'm being challenged by this, mm-hmm. uh, but how can I stay in the world? How can I stay being myself? How can I continue to function? And how can I continue to um, encompass joy and and all of that stuff and share and give and and everything and also go through this Mm -hmm. and actually feel the feelings, express it all, and then keep moving. And and that's, that's, I think, where it's at, where it's Mm -hmm. like, yeah, be in the world because there's lots of shit coming up. So people need, um, need examples of their neighbors just being able to get through stuff and, and not just get through it, but continue mm-hmm. uh, whatever they're on. And I think that's the examples now, like that people need to see it, not just on um, bigger influences, authors, you know, movies like The Secret or mm-hmm. um, teachers and stuff, because not everybody knows to access, you know, a specific avenue like yoga or a specific avenue like self-development or mm-hmm. whatever you want to, you know, take sometimes. And I guess that's going to be the shift, right? That like yeah. someone meets someone at the grocery store and they have a just a conversation and all of a sudden this person's like, I feel awakened and I'm going to go and change up my life now and it works. And, yeah. you know, like they'll have a different 
set of challenges that come, mm-hmm. you know. And and I think also the difference is like we're going to have that as well. Like we're going to have this a nice, I feel like a nice um, time of flow and ease while other the next wave is catching up and then with longevity and connection and, and health and everything now, um, we'll probably get a second chance at going through another kind of wave wave of it uh-huh. yeah, and we'll get to experience it because it's happening quicker. Yeah. You know? No, nah, good point. I think so too. That's exciting. I'd it like another big wave. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's going to be many waves. Yeah, We're yeah. still so young. Yeah, true. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> and just the, it does feel, especially like, I mean, it's so unknown, the mystery, like with yeah. technology. Yes. Like Joe and I often marvel at like, and looking at our young kids, like, holy shit, like it's so unknown with like, the catastrophes of nature, like that is so unknown. Mm-hmm. Like with like the Amazon jungle just getting ripped to shreds, the kind of lungs of the world, like fuck, where's that going to be in another 10 years, let alone 20 or 30? Like it's scary. Mm. Yet there's all this hope and beauty blossoming. It's it's such an interesting time. Yeah, what time. a contrast. Yeah. What an extreme Like the, the horror of like what is just so rapid of what's happening to the earth the heavily polluted oceans, like it's just like, fuck, are we too late? And, you know, I think there's a lot of people that go, yeah, it's too late, why bother? Right. You know, like like small changes won't make mm, a difference. You know, like will. like me buying um, some a metal straw and my own chopsticks and my own, you know, wooden cutlery to go somewhere and my sustainable cup and, mm-hmm. you know, like looking at sustainable fashion instead and same with beauty products mm-hmm. and, you know, um, how I buy food and packaging and recycling and, you know, all of that stuff. And when traveling, you know, um, not uh, like just, yeah, so many things. It's like um, that in itself, if you were to turn to sustainability as something to even concentrate on, Mm -hmm. regardless of everything else, it's like that's overwhelming in itself. Like there is so much that you can do. So you go, okay, sustainability, oh, my God. Like how are there people that are condensing their rubbish into a jar for a year? Uh And I'm like, I want to be like that, but like at the moment, um, I've I, I've got my cup and I've got my stuff well, that we I do when pe- I recycle. We need those trailblazers that are taking They're that crazy. stuff to the edge because <laughs> yeah. that that is part of the tipping point. Like people it really shows that. taking it to the edge, and yeah. then we're doing our thing. I, I admit to we, you know, we fill up our bins with shit yeah. every week, and yeah. and it disgusts us, and we're we're trying. And we're making a conscious effort yet to do it on that level of what some people are doing of just like next yeah. to no rubbish. And you know, it's like inspiring. with, with like lifestyle now, like there are so, obviously there are so many tangents you can concentrate on like, okay, sustainability. So let's say the environment recycling and all that stuff. But then of course, yeah, then your diet and what you're eating and how it's affecting your gut and your mm-hmm. mind and whether it's organic or not. And da, 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 da. and then, um, you know, like, obviously so many things, politics, you can concentrate on this and there and government and, and there are so many ways like things that regardless of your own kind of joy or your own hobbies and passions, there are so many things that if you even slightly, when I think I'll go down that path and try to implement those things in my life or start concentrating on them, it is like there's so much information. Where do you even start? And it's like, if you could do a little bit of all of the things, Mm -hmm. that would be great. But it's, it's hard to find because yeah. you would need to be following, let's say on social media, it's a great tool if mm-hmm. you can um, curate it yes. to um, give you the things that are potent, that sp- speak potently to, mm-hmm. to you, you know, individually. That's a great thing. But, you know, then you follow your friends as well and then you follow like some celebrities and then you follow some like bands you like and then you follow some like just great things and then holes. you're looking at it and you're like, oh, my God, like, yeah. you know, and it's fascinating and I think that's part of the challenge mm. too, like to go, well, I'm going to make the effort and be more disciplined to always take mm. my keep cup and always do this and always like never use plastic bags. And I'm, you know, I'm going to make sure that to keep my own health right. You well, know, I think once again, these things it and, starts as your own inner work. Yeah. Like, cause if we're treating our own body like shit and we're yes. feeding it rubbish, there's a high chance we're not going to go give a crap if we're feeding the earth heaps of rubbish. Like yep. it, it all just feeds into one another. Yep. Yet once we start feeling good, 
and our consciousness is flowing a bit clearer. It just makes it very easy to make a, a more conscious decision. Yeah. I know when I'm feeling like shit or I'm hungover or it's just been a bad yeah. week, a bad yeah. week of eating. You or really notice it. Just feeling more toxic than usual. I don't make as good a decision. It's like yeah. I'm just I'm just not on a good on an optimum vibration. And then yeah. just like, you know, who gives a shit? And uh, I don't play a part. Like you just feel so small <laughs> and shriveled. And I definitely have moments where I feel like that, even though I'm very passionate about nutrition and feeding yes. the body beautifully and self-practice and self-care and just beautiful things. Every now and then, yeah, if I'm not, you could say, diligent with how I am feeding the body, even though I just I enjoy healthy food, if it's been just one of those times, yeah, it it, it like shrivels up my consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I think that's key. And you know, again, start within, start within and, and then the outer actions will just be a correlation yeah, the, with that. The physical manifestations of all of that start to kind of flow out and having patience with it, mm -hmm. you know, like, patience. and, and, you know, like the, the, I don't think that the earth, you know, it's not like she doesn't have a sense of humor. You can't have, it's not like if everything that's going on, um, you're no longer allowed to have fun, everything in moderation, right? Yeah. But the same with that, that if you push anything mm -hmm. to the extreme, there comes a point where someone, there's a loud clap and it's like, this isn't a game. Mm -hmm. Like stop fucking around, you know. And if that's with your eating, something happens. Or mm -hmm. if that's with drinking or if that's with, yeah, treating your own self like shit um, and maybe you don't realise, you know, that it's not moderation anymore. Mm -hmm. And for us, the people that are lucky enough to have the choice, sometimes I know I get lazy with that because I'm like, but I have the choice. Yeah. And that part of me goes, so just have another glass of wine and do this and all oh, that's all right. And, you know, like I said before, sometimes I just have to go, okay, yeah, I made that choice anyway um, and kind of ease back into mm -hmm. a better, a higher vibration. But, yeah, like it's it's a lot of people I think look at it like, oh, well, like, mm. oh, I would never be able to get my rubbish into a glass jar for yeah. the whole year. That's absolutely ridiculous. So they go, it's too late for us all. Who gives a shit? Yeah. And, you know, like, oh, oh you know, um, I need plastic bags for this or da 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 da, da because it's change and it, it seems harder because the truth is if you've got a, if you have expanded a little, it's not as difficult mm. to implement more habits and changes. If you've done enough practice on, I changed this habit, it was possible. I needed patience for it. I changed this habit, possible. I needed patience for it. Mm -hmm. You get a bit more used to going, okay, I'm going to change this. And as long as I commit to it for two, three, four weeks, it'll be ingrained. It's fine. Like that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but if you've never done that, you don't think anything's possible to change and that all the things are so heavy to change. But they're not, it's, they get easier like anything, you know, practice and mm. practice in the actual changing of it or the actual acceptance of it yeah. is hard. But once you get used to it, it gets easier to keep moving through that stuff, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. And even the loving discipline to like, you've talked about like switching off from social media yeah. from time to time and just pulling back from that noise. Yeah. Cause that is a heavy one. That's a big one that is causing just a lot of grief, Yeah, a lot of grief. And uh, especially with the younger people coming up that. Well, cause it's their life, right? It's their like, life. Yeah. And maybe they don't know a life before social media. Yeah. And then there's this uh, outrage culture that is becoming very strong mm. via social media. And I, I spoke about it in my last podcast quite a bit because she's a early childhood teacher, um, Gillian. But we were speaking yes, quite I spoke a bit. with her recently. Yeah, she's awesome. <laughs> yeah, she's yeah, great. She's beautiful. And uh, just this new phenomenon of outrage culture and bullying, like social media mm. bullying, in which people feel totally fine, like just leaving a whole panoply of negative comments, mm. which would just be a projection of how they're feeling. They just need to vent it, which most likely wouldn't happen face to face with that person. Mm. Like it takes that person ability away and that accountability and responsibility. That's a big one right now. Mm -hmm. So that discipline to pull back from social media, whether it's just the distract distractedness of it or 
you're witnessing or part of that 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 negative rampant that is really strong right now. That's yeah, running and, heavy. You know, it's like I, and I don't know if you experience this, but I know I experience that if I'm maintaining my social media presence, like you know, let's talk algorithms and stuff. Like for a business, like trying to keep afloat and mm-hmm. and stuff, like that's imperative. If, yeah, if I'm not doing that it's completely relayed in my income, you know, Mm -hmm. like completely and, um, and the opportunities and things and stuff. So, um, I'm not at that point where I can maintain it yet Mm -hmm. and go, you know, I did this Kickstarter and for five weeks I felt so good about it. And I was, cause it was full of content. It was expressive. It was great. And I had a bit of a plan to it, you know, and, it was positive. It was really good. I loved engaging with people mm-hmm. and the being able to use like polls and stories and talking to people and responding with videos mm-hmm. and like on all the platforms, like was so fun because everybody's from all over the world. And I know that in that aspect, I'm using social media as a business, you know, um, because, but, but I'm my business, my emotions and my expression is my business. So to try and find that line of I'm also staying in touch with people I know and Mm -hmm. following people I admire or I'm inspired by and whatever. And then whenever I'm going into the cave to go, right, I want to do the best kind of versions of my own art that I can do or whatever, I create way better stuff. Like in the last two weeks, oh, Instagram story worthy like out, you know, like I was in the mixing, I was in the recording studio mixing. The next day I painted a mural and I had two gigs, um, you know, uh, got road trips, the beach, best friend was over, like amazing. Do you think like I even slightly put any of that on social media? Like I just You're crazy. didn't. Yeah, didn't even I happen just, then. I, I know. <laughs> and then I get a little bit like, oh my God, when was the last time I posted? And I, it's like, I want to, but I'm still in that little cocoon where I'm a bit like, I'm really enjoying this life. But that changes when I I have something where I'm like, you know, in order to continue, like when this project gets released, like as a business, that side of things, like thinking about it ahead and going, okay, well, I know I'm going to fall off at some point and creating a plan, uh, you know, like it sounds so boring and so out of this spiritual world where it's like, oh, I'm going to do an Instagram plan or a social media plan of how like my content can go out. But that's that boring part that you go, you know what, I'm going to do that so that in my day-to-day life, if I'm going and I'm doing something and I'm like, I don't want to be doing selfies and talking to a screen, I've got a bank of great creative content that I've got there that I can mm-hmm. share. So it allows as an individual the kind of the presence to still be there and it's still real and it's there mm-hmm. but not being out being all there and all out mm-hmm. and all there and all out because that inconsistency is, um, you know, I know from my personal journey that's a pretty good representation of how I've even treated creativity. So right. to kind of maintain it, mm-hmm. that's a test for me. Yeah. It's a challenge. It's a good measurement to be able to go, oh, yeah, I'm getting it done. And mm-hmm. I think that's like that whole witnessing thing that if people um, – were able to get that perspective, kind of like that observer thing and and recognize those patterns and challenges and get playful with it and creative with how they're approaching the day-to-day and the mundane and stuff. It adds a a whole different vibe to everything. But, yeah, there's boring shit to do in being free as well, you know? Yeah. Um, No, good point. Um, I think a a, a part of the attempt to create just constant utopia, constant positivity yeah. is a an avoidance of mm. the boring aspects of life. And I, I hear it all the time. Like uh I hear it a lot in the in the plant medicine community of like this I'm paraphrasing of what I'm hearing, but it's this attempt to abolish the mundane, like mm. and escape boring well, then Life. you're not alive anymore. I know. Well, that, that's the thing, but it seems you won't so, be. You won't be alive. It's very convincing, and I've been there myself as right, well. Yeah. Because whether it's a satori experience in meditation or a peak experience while listening to music and looking at art, and like there is so much beauty. Yes. Like when we get out of our mind and get into spirit and into the heart, whether that's through art or through yoga, meditation, or music or plant medicine, whatever unlocks it. That ultimate state it is ultimate reality it is the core of our being 
So often if that isn't grounded in this reality, people kind of resent the mundane, the boring, mm. the struggle. Absolutely. Because it's only relatively real. It's just this passing kind of phenomenon. And you feel it. And feelings are so strong, mm -hmm. you know, like it, it, it's real. Yeah. It's like the best thing. It's, it's intangible. It's mm -hmm. the best thing that's ever possible. Yeah. And you feel that connection. And yeah, so I know if you try to bring it into the mundane world, it, it if you're not um, able to accept that, mm -hmm. it gets tainted or yeah. it's like, why would I ruin it by, um, yeah, bringing it into the mundane? I'd rather keep it. And I think that's a lot of like, I think that representation is what a lot of people go through with, say they have a dream to follow um, and fear turns up or something turns up or some kind of a routine structure belief kind of thing comes up to um, stop from bringing whatever's in your inner world or your dreams or whatever joy you want to follow, something convinces you that, yeah, but it's not real in the real world mm -hmm. because it seems as a dream or a fantasy or whatever it is feels so good mm -hmm. to imagine it, you know, and um, the truth is that probably that people don't want to hear that, you know, yeah, there's going to be boring everyday freaking aspects of this that will suck and you'll you'll get to feel those feelings in those moments and more you know closer together as mm -hmm. you go but yeah no one no one wants to actually know that it's hard work mm -hmm. but you're doing what you love and the payoff is great because it's you and yeah. you're doing what you're meant to do and so the um, feelings of feeling great are more often and more sustainable. Um, but yeah, there's going to be some shit. It just flips. It's instead of mm -hmm. having the spikes of like, oh, I'm so connected. You have these low kind of low grade. This is really boring. Those spikes of that. And, yeah. you know, like I'd rather have it that way, but it's a, it's a big bridge to cross. It's a big bridge. And we're so, where we get so attached and addicted and it feels so much better to be in that, in that high, in that cosmic, expansive state. How good state. is the addiction? And it's so good. It's it, the best. And it is a great addiction, <laughs> but it causes a lot of agony. Yeah, it does this, this attempt to bypass, bypass boredom, stuff. bypass yeah. relationship, uh, like true intimacy, like yeah. real deep intimacy and kind of just be with just be with spirit yeah. like it yeah that's <laughs> like <an> really <laughs> yeah yeah um and again it, it, yogis and mystics have been doing it that way for so long like just be with the true self like just be in the oneness but mm. then like there's this other movement of okay let's do that and do the boring shit mm. and mm -hmm. go face to face in those relationships that trigger you and mm -hmm. Follow through, follow through with those dreams that you've been wanting to do. Even been, if they take a long time, yeah. like step by step. And, you know, that's the whole mandala thing that mm -hmm. I think that taught me a lot, you right. know, just like connecting the dots and just repeating the same little loop, you it's know, quite a practice, over huh? and over and over and over again and yeah. disappearing into it doing these boring parts. Like I know that when I physically draw dots, I love doing dots for shading and I do it and I start it and I'm like, why have I chosen this huge surface area to do dots for shading. Oh my God. And I start and I'm like, this is going to, I'm going to be doing dots for like half an hour. We'll look at but, Aboriginal painting. Right. <laughs> and then you look at the end piece and you're like, those yeah. dots, they yeah. make it. Oh man. Like, remember how shit that was like, <laughs> and that's like, it's just that metaphor for life, you know, yeah. like that there's moments, there's times where it's just like, Ugh. have you seen the, <laughs> um, the Tibetan monk, the Tibetan practice of creating the the tapestry or the the mandala or whatever it may be, like with the fine coloured dust. Yeah, like the sand stuff, yeah. and then so they're the, yes. just like such patience, just chipping away at it, chipping away, and then it's done, and they have a moment of witnessing and meditating, and then they blow it away. <laughs> I love that. It's powerful. Because like, yeah. that's what I guess the understanding around mandalas are is that, you know, they're, they're, it's a Sanskrit word for circle. You know, that's what it translates mm -hmm. to. And, you know, that representation of the never ending cycle and circle of life and the universe and all aspects of those um, spirals, you know, mm -hmm. and the impermanence of it. 
and also the never endingness of it mm-hmm. and and that kind of thing that when you know i guess the the practice of it is that you you create the peace and then you let it go yeah. you create the peace and then you let it go with every moment you feel the moment and then you let it go mm-hmm. you experience the experience and then you let it go and we have those addictions and those highs because we want to hold on to the yes. moment and how great it is and extend it out mm-hmm. and then the come down from that or the recognizing that now it's no longer there is so devastating you know that then it's like you're probably even further away from it then because mm-hmm. like oh my god and then the road back oh how far I had to go to get that oh. or you know how much I had how much of myself I had to sell or mm-hmm. give away to get that and you know like yeah it feels like the the middle path is a great kind of for for, for those listening that, that are resonating thinking yeah that that I need more of that balance. The, mm. There's a common uh, framework for exactly that, the middle path of enjoying the highs, enjoying the positive aspects of life without getting attached to it, which is a very, mm. it's a, that that is a strong practice. And then part of that middle path is being able to witness the negative aspects and see the lessons of it and mm. not contract from it. So that middle path mm can kind of wraps up a lot of what we've spoken about the witnessing the kind of going after those heart visions and dreams and goals and whatnot and being driven being positive being affirmative at the same time letting it go letting it go enjoying the highs of life really letting that ecstasy flow Mm. not getting attached to that letting it go and then that that ability to keep coming back to the center and then you're able to get more of the highs because the sooner you let it go the sooner it revisits and it comes back you know because you're able to move through whatever the flow wherever it's leading you quicker than if you Try everything to hold on and get back there. It's and agonizing. Keep it there. Ah, and then you're try stretched to hold on to it. It's just so broken from it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I heard a thing. Uh, actually, I went to a talk um, uh, here in Perth and uh, it was by a uh, musician who works in the industry. He's a lot older now and um, has done a lot of research. And one of the things I really took from it was um, he was explaining like, for creatives. So if there are like um, highly creative thinkers that are listening and so if this flipped my world, um, he, exp- I know he's going to have a book come out and I'll have to, when I know what it is, I'll, I'll let you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> you can pass it on, but, yeah, um, or I'll, I'll be sharing it as well. But um, yeah, do this talk on that. I know that in the, specifically in the music industry, this, all these understandings is very like, there's been no um, kind of research in uh the music world or industry, you know, there's no regulations. Like we don't have insurance. We don't have, like, there's just nothing of the normal kind of everyday world. We're not open to that. We don't have support. There's no organizations that give support. There's no tools. We're not taught how to actually maintain a life. And the average age of uh, professional musicians, not necessarily big names, but people who play music, the average life expectancy is 56. And that's the average for in the music industry. And so he'd kind of done a lot of uh, experimenting um, or uh, um, research into um, highly creative thinkers. And that idea of balance, you know, um, people around highly creative people are often going, God, you go to the extremes, mate. Mm -hmm. Like that's why you feel shit. That's why, you know, you've got to get some balance in your life. And they're coming from a place generally of balance, meaning like just be a bit more subdued. Mm -hmm. Just don't go that far. Just don't be as you as you are. And they mean well. Obviously they love you, they care about you and stuff. Um, And that society that understands that that way as well. But um, the idea of balance being that for highly creative people, it's actually having the extremes um, that creates the balance and Mm -hmm. being able to go all in on this way is part of it. Okay. You've got to balance it by going all in the other way. And that is the experience. And so I know that when I saw that up on the screen and he, you know, it was going through different aspects of life. Like mm-hmm. one of them was about being either super messy or super anal about it. Mm-hmm. And you know, that, that if that's something that a highly creative person resonates with, I personally do where mm-hmm. everything has a place. And if that little candle or thing is not right. I wake up every day and it's perfect. But if I'm in my creative mode or some moment, oh, there'll be like 
piles of rubbish over there. I haven't gone to the bin yet. I haven't washed my <laughs> dishes for three days. I don't know where anything is. It's everywhere. And one day I'll wake up and be like, <gasps> who came in here and did this? I have got to fix this. And it, you know, and that is the balance and that is constant. And so I think that um, there's an interesting aspect that I know that really shifted a lot for me. Mm. Like it gave me a bit more like – I felt like it was this sigh of relief kind of going, oh, so it's okay to be like that. And it took all this pressure off of me kind of being like, oh, but everybody says, you know, I've got to have the balance and, you know. Well, that is interesting. Like, Mm, I found uh, it very interesting. Shakti is creative energy, Mm. feminine energy, just Mm. women who embody a lot of femininity. I mean, it's like that. Like you never know what you're going to get one day. It's going to be just excited and beautiful and radiant and, positive and then the next day kind of moody and it like yeah. that's shakti that's feminine energy that's creative energy so you kind of never know what you're going to get yeah. with it and trusting in that is kind of like trusting in the weather like yeah. the, one day it's going to be rainy the next day it's going to be sunny like just letting weather do its thing yeah we've got that operating through us as well and some people have a bit more masculine energy which can which is a bit more predictable, you could say, yeah. a bit more linear and it's more structured, yeah, kind of yeah. more structured. Or I mean, if you push masculine into the mystical aspect, that that's meditation, that's the witness, that's yes. here. But the feminine is spontaneous. Who and knows? It's, who knows? It's <laughs> all the fluctuations of form. Mm. So what, someone that is naturally very creative most likely has a lot of that shakti flowing, which. Yeah, we see that in a lot of great songwriting, like the 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 ups and the downs that creates great poetry and great yes. lyrics and yeah, being okay with that, I think yeah, is a beautiful thing. Again, witnessing it seems yeah. help seems helpful yeah. for one's sanity. <laughs> yeah, and it is hard if like say you're um around people or maybe your significant other mm. isn't like that or doesn't right. get it or whatever because they you know, I know for me, I can get so like super creative and passionate and amazing, mm. and then low and like frustrated right. and angry at the process. And that's part of my process. Mm. And I'm very aware that I'm, I can feel the feelings. So I'll be quite vocal at, like, okay, like shit's going to go down over the next little while because like, I'm not feeling this. Like, <laughs> you know, just like back off for a bit, you know, and, and that works for some people and it doesn't work for others. Mm. And some people just don't like to witness such extreme changes all the time and so that can feel um tough because they they love you or they want to support you but the way that they understand it is okay let's just like try and avoid these things mm. and try and avoid those things and then yeah it's like we do that for ourselves as well and so i think understanding it and kind of just being able to dive into it accept it and move mm-hmm. through it and um utilize it and turn it into something yeah um is so to the be key. yeah the key and to be in relationship with that mm. The other party would need to really be in there, you could say conscious masculine, like be a container for that yeah. and just be clear. Like if you're both That's like that, way. Yeah. it can be a bit mad. It can, I think it can work, yeah. but it can be a bit mad. But I think for that to work, like in a healthy, like long-term relationship with mm-hmm. another, um, the other being needs to be able to, okay, witness it. Yeah. And then yeah, be like be the Shiva, be the be the conscious masculine, be a container for it and like yeah. just nourish it and love on it and but it's a it's a strong practice, just that. Yeah. To like. have compassion <laughs> and have clarity to go, all right, here's this beautiful Shakti energy just just going for life. Yep. And I'm gonna just be the kind of container for that and, and house it and nourish it and love on it. It takes a lot of clarity, a yeah. lot of clarity yeah. for someone that's in their own kind of tension and they're feeling kind of dull or maybe they're just overwhelmed and they haven't done their practice at mm. all, mm. let alone every day. Mm. It's a lot. And yeah. um, I get why it overwhelms people. Like mm-hmm. whew, it's just a lot of life energy, a lot of up and down and storm and pew, pew, pew. Mm. and um. So for people that are in a relationship with someone like you, what, what you just described, the, the, the highest, the lowest, the creative energy, the fluctuations, mm. yeah, do your practice, like get yeah. in touch with the witness, get your mind quiet regularly, take time to just 
pull out, pull away and yeah. get nourished, get grounded, get strong. And then yeah, practice witnessing the beauty of it and see if you can be the other polarity to it and kind of, uh, be a be a kind of rock for it so to speak yeah and i think that's actually a nice you know if you have the chance to experience that it's like a way that you can experience within yourself as well like of course be the witness and and observe how you know you have that individually i think there's a lot of um let's say straight people Mm -hmm. that are straight laced i mean you know like very structured or Mm -hmm. very kind of routine and that are it's coming out in the world now you know where uh it's just there is that feminine kind of what unknown and people want to be creative and they have a little more courage to go after their dreams and stuff. And and that does mean inviting in like the muse and kind of like chaos. And mm-hmm. because that's kind of where it's born, you know, it, it's chaotic and it's yeah. all the, over the place. And so I think people resist it a lot right. within themselves because yeah, they don't know how to witness it. That's crazy. Yeah. Like, you know, there's way too much fear around that. I'm not, cause I can't do it in a structured way Mm -hmm. and you know um yeah and then the people that are super creative you know who do a million things that are amazing and or are the most talented musician or guitar player Mm -hmm. or something but don't want anything to do with ever putting it out in the world because i'm not going to put that box on it or i'm not going to put that structure on. i'm not going to ruin it Mm -hmm. you know because it's hard to balance the two or have that capacity to kind of it is hard and the support around you you know as well and so it's interesting it's like you've got to kind of have that within yourself in all those things and then um let it all go as well you know let it all go Mm. i think that's a great place to wrap this up Morgan, I love your work. Thank you. You're doing beautiful work and uh, we'll leave links below yeah. for people to get in touch with your platforms. Uh, do you, what, what is your website? It's, it's my name, okay. morganjonel.com. Yeah. Thought so. And yeah. uh, you've just got the one social media. Name, like handle? Yeah. Or, yeah. Okay. It's the same on every single platform. Great. Well, yeah. I'll leave them below. It's been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you for so much here. for inviting me as well. It's been great to chat. Yeah. It's been nice to reconnect as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's really good. Thank you. Beautiful. Well, much love. You too. <laughs>